It's my honor to introduce Steve Dembo, a pioneer in the field of educational social networking. He's a former kindergarten teacher and director of technology. As Discovery Education's Director of Learning Communities, Social Media Strategy, and Innovation, Steve was instrumental in the explosive growth of the award-winning community, the Discovery Education Network. Steve is the co-author of the book, Untangling the Web, 20 Tools to Power Up Your Teaching, along with our Wednesday keynote, Adam Bellow. In 2010, the National School Board Association named him one of the 20 to watch 20 to Watch honors educators who are passionate about using technology to transform teaching and learning, capable of inspiring their colleagues to embrace new tools, curious by nature, and always thinking about how the next innovation can be applied to education. Dembo is also a course designer and adjunct professor for Wilkes University. He's the father of both a son and a daughter, and proudly serves as the president of his school board. We are excited that Steve will be joining us and presenting all three days of this conference. Now it is time to explore what literacy in the digital world means for our students and how to cultivate it with our students. It is time to hear about Bill. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Thank you much. Appreciate it. That's like the best bio slide I've ever seen. I love that. And that really actually does sum up my life pretty well. I'm not sure I have any Star Wars action. Oh, I do have some Star Wars in this presentation. Good. I'm not going to disappoint any of you. How are all of you? Good. I know it's early, isn't it? Coffee's still working your way through the system, along with the pastry continental and all that. I get it. Um, hopefully, uh, we're going to have a little fun this morning and set you up for the conference for the rest of the event. I'm very excited to be here. I'm assuming you saw this. He was talking about the conference hashtag. I strongly, I know we were talking about putting your phones on uh, vibrate, but at the same time, I hope you keep it in hand. If you're a social media type person, I hope that you do tweet throughout. Conference hashtag is NHCMTC, which I totally screwed up yesterday, so I'm going to be using it better today. And. This entire presentation is based off of a meme called Be Like Bill. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it was one that was kind of floating around the interwebs about a year, year and a half ago or so. This was the original one. It said Bill is on the internet. Bill sees something that offends him. Bill moves on. Bill is smart. Be like Bill, right? Simple. And a lot of people looked at that and they said, well, all right, that, that's, a, that's a neat little way to kind of share a message. I have a message to share as well. I'm going to adopt that same style, make my own version of it. And they made things like this. This is Madison. Madison sees it's raining outside. She doesn't post it on Facebook because she knows her friends have eyes. <laughs> Madison is smart. Be like Madison, right? Yeah, it's, it's simple, right? You don't always have to. You don't have to post everything you eat. You don't have to post the weather. You don't have to post every single thing. And so people were using these memes as a way to kind of make a statement and, and share things out. Now, of course, at a certain point, it got a little saturated, and a few thousand people had shared variations on this meme, and people started to push back against it, and that's when you started to see memes like this. This is Uma Thurman. She killed Bill. Be like Uma, kill Bill. Of course, that makes a lot more sense if you're familiar with the Tarantino movie, Kill Bill, and if you haven't seen that, then it might not make as much sense and so on. You do have to have a little bit of background knowledge um, and so on. Now, the other interesting thing about this meme is, if you look at it from an educational perspective, this meme happens to actually be, and I'm going to have to read it because I can never remember this uh, uh, verbatim. This is a perfect example of the third person singular of the present simple tense. But all of you knew that, right? Right? Some of us don't remember the third person singular of the present simple tense. Of course not, because it didn't make any sense at the time when we were taught it. It didn't really worm its way into our mind. We didn't have any associations with it. It was learned in isolation, and things that are learned in isolation tend to be more ephemeral. When you can tie something that you're learning to something that you already have associations with, it tends to be more sticky, which is why this teacher did something brilliant, and she used this meme as a way to teach the third person singular present simple tense. And she actually had the students creating memes that go along with it. And now these kids are going to remember this meme, they're going to remember the third person singular present simple tense, and they will never be able to forget it for the rest of their lives, right? It also ties into something very powerful about memes in general. 
They are memorable. There's a lot of reasons why they're memorable. They're actually very powerful ways to communicate. And we're gonna get into sort of the science of them a little bit more and delve into it. But the other thing, the reason why they're very memorable is they're playful, they're fun, they make us laugh, especially when they tie in something like this that's already familiar, we understand that schema, we understand that construct, and then you tie it into something we also have other associations with, like pop media and so on. For example, this is Rick. Rick will never give you up, let you down, run around, desert you, make you cry, say goodbye, uh, tell a lie, or hurt you. Be like Rick. Now, some of you are more amused than others. <laughs> Those of you that are more amused are familiar, what song is this one from? Never gonna give you up, you read the Rick Astley song and so on, right? Which is also, has, you know, it was very, very popular in the 80s. I don't know why, but it was. And then it kind of went away and then it came back and in meme form as what? The Rickroll. How many of you are, uh, don't know what I mean when I say Rickroll? Now, isn't that amazing? Because he here's the irony. The people that know what a Rickroll is probably think everybody in the world knows what a Rickroll is. It's totally omnipresent, it's totally pervasive throughout the entire internet. And yet, it's actually just still sort of a, a subculture sort of thing. I'll explain to you what a Rickroll is, okay? You got this song, uh, you know, the, the Rick Astley never gonna give you up. The way that it works is, it's sort of like a sucker punch. It's your expectation is when you follow this link, you're gonna get this, and instead, you get something different. One of the largest Rickrolls, the first class, the one that really launched it into the mainstream, revolved around Radiohead. At one point, Radiohead was coming out with a new album, LP7, and they announced it, but they didn't really have any information about it, they never released it, they didn't have anything else about it. And then all of a sudden, this website goes up, and it has a countdown timer. It doesn't say anything else, it just says like Radiohead LP7, and it has a countdown timer. Millions and millions of people assumed this was the Radiohead website, and when that countdown timer got to zero, it was going to launch the new album. So it started off with days, hours, minutes, seconds. So when it finally started counting down to the final five, four, three, two, one, there was about 15 million people online when they, the countdown timer got to zero, and they got. Oh, I need more like that. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll click the button here and I'll just leave it right there, okay? That's what they got. They got Rick Astley doing that. That's a Rick roll. They were expecting the Radiohead album, they got that. People also try and hide these in plain sight sometimes. This was an essay. This is an essay about, I don't know, like nuclear physics, and, you know, physics and so on and so forth. And the student in the essay, in the left hand column, put the entire lyrics to Never Gonna Give You Up. The student, in a very well-written professional essay, rickrolled their teacher. <laughs> Reddit rolled, right? And what's even better is, the student got an A plus <laughs> on the essay. If you can rickroll your teacher and still get an A plus, you deserve an A in the class just for that. It's impressive, right? People still do it today. There's this element of play around it, right? This is a few years ago uh, in Oregon. Uh, the House was tied with the, uh, the Democrats and Republicans, there were 30 for each, in an effort to show that they could actually work together, work across by, uh, party lines so and be part, bipartisan. They created, over uh, uh, three days of debate around a specific bill, they created this video. We're no strangers to love. You know the rules, and so do I. The full commitment's what I'm thinking of. You wouldn't get this from any other guy. I just want to tell you how I'm feeling. Make sure you understand. I'm never going to give you up. I'll never let you down. We're not going to run around and desert you. Brilliant, right? It's an effort to show, yes, that they can work together, that they can create something, but they can also have some fun doing it. That how you know, there's still people. There's still people. There's still human beings, and so on. And you can have a you know, a, a, you know, some fun while you're doing this kind of stuff. You still see it today, during the election cycle, during the at the Republican National Convention, there was a rickroll. I don't know if it was deliberate or not, but this was in Melania Trump's speech. <laughs> She 
was rickrolling the American people or if her speechwriter was rickrolling her. I have no idea. All I know is pure genius. That almost earned my vote right there, okay? It's funny, it's silly, it's ridiculous. And yet there's actually something kind of powerful going on there. Yeah, I know it's an older meme and all that, but there's still, see I told you there's gonna be some Star Wars in there. The word meme and the modern connotation of it is often attributed to a guy uh, uh, named Rick uh, Dawkins. Now, uh, Rick Dawkins uh, is, this is Rick Dawkins. I actually misheard when somebody was first telling me about this guy and said that I should be looking into him. I, I totally misheard the name. I thought they said, uh, not Richard Dawkins. I thought they said Richard Dawson. That's completely different. So don't confuse those if you're actually talking about this later to somebody else. Um, Richard uh, Dawkins uh, had this great quote about memes and you, you could kind of summarize the whole thing uh, uh, by just this statement. A uh, meme is a cultural item that is transmitted by repetition and replication in a manner analogous to the biological transmission of genes. They spread, they mutate, they move around. The strong ones survive and sometimes even uh, uh, bring in the characteristics from other ones and the weak ones just die. A strong meme will last for a long time. It will resonate, it will stick with you in your memory, it will be replicated, it will be remixed, and so on and so forth. A weak meme like the ones my mom tries to do on Facebook sometimes, die. It just happens, you know what I mean? Um, does it work? Is it powerful? You tell me, I'm gonna show you an image right here and just read it aloud in your own head. And then I'm just gonna ask you, did it, did it work, okay? So read this in your own head. <laughs> Can you guys see this all the way in the back? It says, hi, my name is Morgan Freeman and you're reading this in my voice. Were you reading it in your own head, in his voice? You were, weren't you? Because you can't not do it. The second you see that it's Morgan Freeman, that immediately changes the words on the page. You immediately give it a sense of gravitas. You immediately start reading a little bit more slowly. You take it a little more seriously. That image completely changed the way that you read those words. That's powerful. That can level of association. It can actually tweak the way you feel and the way you're going to feel, the, the, the associations you're going to have with text before you've even started to read it. Think about that. That's powerful stuff. Um, I'm going to show you a, a couple of examples here. I'm going to actually rearrange some things. Uh, no, we'll come back to that. There's a lot of ways. I'm going to show you some examples of, of how powerful that could be in, in just a couple minutes. But the point is, uh, it may feel like I'm adding extra weight to memes. It doesn't always have to be something really serious and really weighty and so on. I'm all for just using them in more casual ways in the classroom. I love when teachers are using them for classroom rules and so on. You know, if you wanted a grade, you should have put your name on it, that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, or for bathroom passes and so on. Uh, I, I love when people just allow themselves to play and experiment and make the classroom a little slightly more magical place. But you can also do it for more serious purposes like checks for understanding teachers who actually say you know after you've done your reading make a meme and that's how you're going to demonstrate to me that you actually understood what you just read you know what I mean and let the kids use that as a check for understanding where they're coming back into class and so on a lot of teachers will use it as a way to introduce a lesson they'll just put this up on the projector as the kids are walking on without geometry life is pointless right some kids are going to find it humorous some kids won't get it until you explain them what a point is you know what I mean? if they don't necessarily have that background knowledge. Einstein developed a theory about space, and it was about time too. A lot of kids aren't going to you know, catch that double meaning, once again, until you actually take the time to explain to them so they have the background knowledge. One of my personal favorite ones for the language arts teachers in the audience, let's eat grandma, and let's eat comma grandma. Punctuation saves lives. Those are two very different statements, right? ELL teachers, there's a great uh, uh, website. They, they, they kind of stopped doing this, but they did around like 70, 80 of these things before they stopped. They created, someone created a website called Grammar Cats, and it's all low cats, and encouraging the student to actually grammar check the low cat. So that one says, I know worship son, son worships me. All right, so what is the correct way to say that sentence uh, and then translate it back and then actually break it down and so on? It's just fun, it's playful. 
and it's actually a decent way for students to kind of demonstrate and express what they're learning. It works. It works. And it's not hard to do either. I know there are many in this room that have seen millions of memes and never made your own. I would uh, be doing you a big disservice if I didn't actually show you how. I will show you one way to do it. Uh, there's a website called me makeameme.org. You can go to that website. You could just click on one of these popular images and then say, you know, this is the, that would be great office space meme. Just type in your top text, type in your bottom text, click make a meme, and it will spit out an image. That's it. Now, if you don't want to do it using that website, you can actually use that website over there called Google and type in how to make a meme. That'll work. Or go into PowerPoint and do it. Or go into Photoshop to do it. Or go into anything. It doesn't happen. There's no magic to it. All it is is adding text with an image to create a new message. That's it. And sometimes it can tell a very powerful story. This is one of my personal favorites from the last year or two. It's uh, this image. Anyone know what this image is from? Arthur. <laughs> Arthur, you know the little aardvark, the children's story and so on? There was one episode where his sister did something that made him mad, and for just a split second, you see him curl his hand into a fist. Arthur, balling his hand into a fist, is a perfect demonstration of the anguish and the pain and the frustration we all feel at times. Times like this, when you're about to take a photo and you get this cannot take photo, you're out of space screen on your phone. You know what I mean? It's a perfect way to describe how you're feeling. That one is fairly obvious. Some of them are not. There are websites like Know Your Meme, which will actually break down the history of that image and the meme and the context in which it's used. You don't necessarily need to do that for every meme, but there are some memes that may have other layers to them, other uses for them, other meanings that you might not be aware of. The classic one is this one called Pepe Le Frog. Pepe Le Frog is a little cartoon frog. Looks a little like Kermit, maybe a little more mischievous. And it has been adopted as an alt-right image, an alt-right symbol. And people have grabbed that frog and used it accidentally in images or in memes and not realize that essentially they were supporting neo-Nazis. You know what I mean? So it is worth sometimes checking out the background on it so you understand the context of it. You understand whether the internet has attributed meaning to it that you might not infer just at face value. The reality is there is a language to it. There is a subtext to it, a vernacular, if you will. I love this quote from David Gunn. He says, understanding what a meme is saying requires mature linguistic and social dexterity. Think about that. Yes, there's often the face value humor level of it. The Morgan Freeman doesn't require a lot, but you gotta know who Morgan Freeman is, and you gotta know the types of things that he's usually in, right? For it to make sense. And if you don't know that, then you probably won't use Morgan Freeman well. The same words can have radically different meanings based on the image that you use to associate it with, right? These are the same words, impressive, most impressive, impressive, most impressive. If I put this one behind it, you say it like impressive, most impressive. You know, it's actually someone who's impressed. What they did was impressive. If I take that image away and replace it with this, it's a different meaning, right? That image is a connotation of sarcasm, and it's condescending. Oh, yeah, impressive. You know what I mean? You better be sure you're using the right one if you're you know, using this in response to an email from your principal. Do you know what I mean? Right? They mean totally different things. And then obviously, sometimes uh, uh, you know, it, it tells you to read it you know, in a very specific and even over the top or even dramatic way. I love this one. Why would you do the thing that I just told your classmate not to do? We all have you know, felt that way in some ways, but people don't necessarily understand the pain and anguish of being an educator until you put this sort of a thing in and you can hear you know, Picard say, why would you do the thing, you know what I mean? Overly dramatic and so on. And of course, every language arts teacher in the room can relate to this one. It's it's a simple thing, can I versus may I, but what we're really thinking in our heads is more like this. Right? It can also be the flip. 
Those words can obviously change the context or the connotations of the image itself. This image is pretty self-explanatory. We've seen this kind of thing, right? We want to turn this into a social commentary. You add the text, and then the teacher said, you may take notes, right? Now it's a statement about our generation, our era, and so on and so forth, right? Now, understanding how to do this, how to use these things, how to use them well, does require some social dexterity. It does require an understanding, some background knowledge. It's not always easy to make something that is subtle and funny. These are two of my favorite ones uh, recently, right? The classic Caesar bottle with the knife through it. That's brilliant, isn't it? You gotta understand the story really well to, to, to be able to create something like that. And then you've got this one over here, the classic roller coaster of the South when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Everybody else, wee! The something, you know what I mean? Being able to do this kind of stuff, it doesn't necessarily just happen accidentally, but it does require some thought. It does require some, you know, some context and so on and so forth to do it and to do it well. And people do take this stuff seriously. It's not all just light and fluffy. It's not all just for fun. If you look at the world of politics, there are people taking this stuff very, very, I'm not gonna try really hard not to get political per se, but I'd be remiss if I didn't delve into this somewhat, right? During the, uh, before uh, the, the, uh, when the, during the, the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The Democratic primaries and so on, right? When it's Bernie versus Hillary. I found this group called Bernie Sanders Dank Meme Statue. This is a group of people who are actively saying, what is Hillary saying right now? And what memes can we promote in order to combat those things? She's talking about this issue. What kind of memes can we come up with? And people would pitch out 5, 10, 15 different memes. They would agree on which one was the most resonant, the most powerful, the most potentially viral, and so on. And then they would all start sharing that specific one in an effort to kickstart it going viral. Sometimes viral is not organic. It is deliberate. It is deliberate. This was a very popular series of memes during that period of time. Bernie or Hillary, where do each of them stand on the issues that matter? Issues like lizards. Bernie would say, heck yeah, I love those little guys. What would Hillary say? No. What are they trying to say about these two candidates? They're trying to say Bernie's the fun one. He's the one that'll play. Hillary doesn't mind it. Hillary's a little bit uh, staunch and so on and so forth. Where do they stand on things like Star Wars? Star Wars Episode uh, you know, Seven was an excellent return to the series roots and so on and so forth. What does Hillary say? Live long and prosper. <laughs> My personal favorite is the tin of cookies. With the tin of cookies, what do you get with Bernie? You get a tin of cookies. What do you get with Hillary? You get a sewing kit or something else in there. Now we laugh, but think about this. Is it fair? Is this nice? This is underhanded. This is subvert, you know, it, it, it's subversion at its best. This is trying to get you at a psychological level. It's trying to say, when you want this, Bernie's gonna give it to you. With a girl, you never know what you're gonna get. You know what I mean? It's not polite, it's not nice in any way, shape, or form, but is it effective? Yeah, it is, because people find it funny and it's real easy to click like and share. This is the world that we're living in right now and people are doing it again and again. It is powerful stuff. And we need to be teaching our kids not only to be able to communicate effectively in this world, but also how to insulate themselves against people who are going to try and trick them, for lack of a better term. If you look up definitions of digital literacy, you see things like you know, critical thinking and evaluation, cultural and social understanding, the ability to find and select information, effective communication, critical uh, and creativity, and so on. This is all the kinds of stuff that we're talking about. It's funny because we used to focus on digital citizenship and cyber literacy a lot more. Do you remember when we used to have to stress about students citing Wiki Wikipedia, and like that was the sky is falling thing, that that was, uh, we were totally stressed about teaching students using Wikipedia as a primary source, and that was the worst we had to worry about. We're right back in that same place, but in different ways. 
That's why I love websites like this, and I'm finding that people are digging them back out and using them again. This is a site called All About Explorers. It looks totally legit. Totally legit. In fact, if you actually click through, it's got a list of all these different explorers. And if you click through any of those explorers, you know what you see? You see something like this. I'm just kidding. Okay, no, I'm just totally joking. Okay. Um, couldn't resist. Um, you see like bios of like explorers and stuff, Lewis and Clark and so on and so forth, right? But all the facts are skewed and wrong and twisted and so on. It's all fake. It looks like a good website. Totally fake, totally bunk. And it's supposed to teach these kids, you know, that you can't believe everything you want and you know, everything on the internet is true, which you wouldn't think we would have to go back to. But I will tell you something. We do. And you know how I know for a fact we do? For Boy Scouts, for Cub Scouts, I was asked by the troop leader to come in and teach a, listen, uh, a lesson about being safe on the internet and cyberbullying and so on and so forth. And so just sort of as an experiment, I gave them a website and I told them, I want you to spend 15 minutes as a group researching this website and then I want you to give me back five facts about what you learned, present it back to me, right? And the website that I sent them to was the Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus. How many of you remember the Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus? Yeah, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it is a whole website devoted to saving the endangered species, the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. It's a wonderful site, there are multiple pages, there are pictures of the tree octopus throughout history and so on. There's just one little trouble with it, and that's that there's no such thing as a tree octopus, right? I mean, duh. We all know this, right? And we used to use this as a way to teach students about you know, facts on the internet and so on. But I took a group of kids that were ranging from 10 to 12 and gave them an assignment to study this and give me back you know, five facts about it. And they did. They each gave me five facts about the tree octopus. And not one of those facts were, that's bull blank. Not one. We're right back to where we were, in some sense. Kids are believing what they see on the internet is true, and even worse, a lot of adults are too. A lot of adults are too. People are believing things when they see tweets and messages like this during hurricane, uh, the hurricane in uh, Texas, when they see a shark swimming up the highway, and that shark gets uh, 147,000 retweets. When they see Houston Airport, Bush Airport, completely underwater, the planes are completely underwater. Hundreds of thousands of retweets and shares. There's only one problem. Neither of those are real pictures. You know what I mean? That's not even Bush, uh, that's not even Houston's airport at all. That was a total Photoshop job, the shark and so on. That, photo sh that shark was actually reported on the news, on TV, that there was a shark swimming upstream on the highway. People believe what they see because they want to. Because they want to. It's why things like this can happen. During this whole NFL, you know, kneeling sittings and so on and so forth, this kind of thing gets shared around. The fact that in the locker room, these people, you know, this person on the Seahawks is burning a flag and everybody else is dancing and chanting around it. This gets hundreds of thousands of shares and retweets. And yet, that's not the image. The original image looks more like that. But people share what they want to believe. That's what's scary. We have to once again teach our kids to be skeptical. We have to teach them to armor up, to be discerning. We have to teach them so that they'll teach their parents and so on and so forth. Because this is the kind of stuff that's happening and it's happening not just because it's funny, it's happening deliberately, it's happening to try and manipulate us. And it's happening on both sides. It's not a red thing or a blue thing. It's happening pervasively. The day after the Women's March, some people were sharing around this photo. Wow, it looks like they got the stupidest people in the country making these signs at the Women's March. It says, make them pay for uh, razors if we pay for tampons. They're implying this was a sign at the Women's March. Anyone see any problem with that? Does it make sense at all? 
No, of course not, because that wasn't an image from the Women's March. It was an image from Great Britain about three or four years ago when they had a protest related to their own health care system and so on and so forth. That's an example from one side. Let's show one from the other side. When the immigration ban got put through, you started to see photos like this that were getting hundreds of thousands of retweets and likes and shares. Wow, detained at Dulles. I feel so much safer now. This was an effort to slam uh, Trump and his uh, administration and so on. There's one trouble with that photo. Does it look right to you? Does that look like TSA? Does TSA have multicolored bins? <laughs> no, of course not. That's not TSA, that's not at the airport. This is from two years ago. School resource officers sued for allegedly handcuffing children with ADHD. A completely different article that somebody just took that photo, stripped it, made their own social message to it, and people shared it because it resonated with what they felt. We talk a lot about what fake news is and isn't. This is fake news. This is a deliberate manipulation to try and get you to feel a certain way, to reinforce your beliefs and so on and so forth. I'll tell you, every single time I see an image like that or the two ones before it or the, and so on, I go to Google. And if you go to Google Images, if you've never done this before, it's worth doing. If you go to Google Images, you can take any image that you've saved to your computer. If you have it on your computer, you can literally just drag it into your browser window. And if you drag it into your browser window, it'll actually say, drop image here. And then it will do a reverse search for that image. It'll show you where that image has been used before. And if you do it with that kid in the handcuffs, you see immediately the articles from 2015 where that image came from. It's not hard to do, just most people don't take the time to do it. We don't take the time because we want to believe, right? I'll show you another example of this, you ready? These are two articles. One is from an extreme right website, or extreme right blog. One is from an extreme left blog. One says, White House finally gives Kellyanne Conway the boot, are you glad? The other says, White House just gave Kellyanne Conway the boot, prepare to be infuriated. And if you click through, the first paragraph says, over recent months, Conway's been the go-to personality speaking on television for Trump, but the networks have banned her from their show because her comments didn't match the official message. Right over there on the co a conservative one, over recent months, Kelly's been the go-to personality speaking on television for Trump, but the mainstream liberal media networks have banned her from their shows claiming her comments didn't match the official message. They took the exact same article, they changed some of the adjectives and some of the verbiage so that it would piss off the left or piss off the right, and then posted it on the appropriate blog and just waited for the clicks and the shares to roll in. This is being done deliberately. People are messing with us. They are doing so. This is just link bait. This is just someone trying to make money off of ad revenue. But then you also have it happening for political purposes and so on and so forth, right? It's happening on a daily basis. It is exhausting trying not to get suckered by this kind of stuff. And I will tell you, there are times after spending 15 minutes on Facebook, all I want to do is literally slam my head into a wall and then just delete the app and put my head in the sand and never look at this kind of stuff again. But we can't do that. We can't do that because we take care of kids. Because we take care of kids. And we're teaching kids how to be discerning, how to not be manipulated by this kind of stuff. We have to teach them that these memes have meaning, that they have themes, that they have a point of view, that they are being used by somebody for an ulterior motive, for a concrete purpose. And if you start going into things like the Common Core or whatever set of standards that you want to use, the ISTE standards, the Common Core standards, almost every set of standards, they talk about these kinds of things. They talk about that students need to know how to add drawings and visual displays to clarify their own ideas. They need to know how to present edge content in diverse media formats, including visually and quantitatively. They need to know how to include multimedia components to clarify information and how to evaluate a speaker's point of view, assessing stance, premises, link ideas, word choice, points of emphasis, and tone used. They need to know what the author's trying to say to them so they can be critical of it and decide for themselves whether it's right or whether it's wrong. How do we do this? Well, one way to do this is by teaching them to do it. 
you know, Caitlin Tucker has a great little, a simple meme assignment. So they read the Joy Luck Club, and then they're supposed to make a meme, but here's the trick. It can't just be an overt meme. It can't just be you reading Romeo and Juliet and saying a rose by any other name would smell as sweet and putting on a cute picture. No, 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 no. It's about the themes of the Joy Luck Club. What is the author trying to demonstrate in that book? What are the themes that they're trying to push, what that they're trying to express, and then making a meme that ties into that theme? If you look at these memes in isolation, you might not even realize the association with Joy Luck Club, but you still get that same sense of message. Things like, who says that life needs to be neat and balanced? I'm only this fierce because I listen to my mom. Who says that I'm not in charge, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. These are ways that students can really demonstrate what they've learned. Sometimes it's even simpler. It could just be a quick hit. I love historical memes. Historical memes are perfect for this kind of stuff. Hey, at Clark, have you seen this before, that Google Maps thing? Last six months completely wasted, right? Honest Abe, anyone got a more creative way of saying 87 years? Or my favorite, Mark Twain, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter tweet. That is such a prototypical type of Mark Twain quote, but you have to really understand Mark Twain's humor in order to write something along those lines, right? You can teach this kind of stuff to kids, and I think we need to be teaching it, not only because it's fun, not only because uh, you know, it helps them understand this point of view perspective, and the other reason is because it helps stick in the brain. Memes, social posts, are some of the longest lasting things that you will consume. Somebody did a very interesting survey, okay? What they did was, or uh, they, brought in, I can't remember the exact numbers, so I'm gonna make up some of the numbers, but you've got the link there, you can go back to it if you want to. Um, about a thousand people, they brought them in, and they showed them like 100 or 200 statements, okay? They showed them quotes from newspapers, quotes from books, lines from movies, from, uh, um, uh, from literature, from newspapers, from fiction, from nonfiction, and they also included tweets and Facebook posts and other sorts of things like that. And they showed them about 100 or 150 of them. Then they sent them away for a month. After a month, they had them all come back. And they showed them a list again. And all they had to do was just look at each statement and say, have you seen that one before? Or have you not seen it before? Is that one new to you or not? Because they mixed in fresh ones with the older ones. And you know what they found? The most memorable messages, the most memorable texts, the most memorable lines, quotes, and so on, were the Facebook posts. They were the most memorable things that people read. The casual language, the things that people share, the personal types of things, that kind of stuff, that was what was more memorable than anything else that those people consumed. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Some marketing companies are actually using memes as a way to filter down the, uh, the applications, to front load the applications. They're saying, in addition to your application, send us a meme and the top 20, top 30 memes that catch our attention. Those are the ones we are going to review first. I know that seems a little nutty, but it's happened multiple times with multiple companies. Especially when you get a stack of 200 resumes, how do you figure out which ones you want to look at, which ones grab your attention, who can do that? And this is something that can be taught. It can be taught, it should be taught, and it doesn't necessarily have to be serious either. You know, teaching kids to manipulate images and have fun with it, it's, it's good because it actually teaches them how to take ownership of it, how to tweak things, how to actually, you know, just take digital media and make it their own. I love these kinds of little simple Photoshop challenges. This is something that somebody put up on one of these forums a few years back, uh, two years ago. Can someone please just Photoshop the Eiffel Tower under my finger? You know, they were trying to do that in one of those pictures where it looks like the Eiffel Tower is under there. Asking the internet to Photoshop you is always a dangerous thing, okay? Because you might start to get things like this, has Eiffel Tower underneath it, then there's this one, a tiny one, I like this one, tipped over, right? You got this one, the, the, the stretched version of it. 
Yeah, and then there's this one. That, that's actually somewhat uh, legit. Then you've got the giraffe version of it. If you've ever played the game Portal, you've got the Portal version of it. And of course, anything about memes has to have at least one Nyan cat. You've got the Nyan cat version of it, and so on and so forth. Doing these kinds of challenges can be fun with kids. Or even the photo challenges. This was a Vadering photo challenge. Could you actually emulate the Vader thing? This is all done by people who would like basically all agree that you, know, you have the Vader just standing right there with their arm up, and then people putting their hands on each other and jumping all at the same time and getting the photo just at exactly the right time. It's just fun. It's playful, it's silly, but it also does teach a lot about you know, photography and digital media and so on and so forth. Now I know some of you are looking at all this kind of stuff and thinking to yourself, really? Is this really something we need to be teaching our students? And here's why the answer to that is yes. I found this little video, it's a little snippet out of a TED talk, but I think it kind of sums up uh, it, it almost, almost perfectly. So I'm just gonna play you about one minute of this video. Now let us stipulate, as the lawyers say, that lolcats are the stupidest possible creative act. Right? There's others that are, there are other candidates, of course, but lolcats will do as a general case. Right? But here's the thing. The stupidest possible creative act is still a creative act. Right? Someone who has done something like this, however mediocre and throwaway, right, has, has tried something, has put something forward in public. And once they've done it, they can do it again and they could work on getting it better. Right? There is a spectrum between mediocre work and good work, and as anybody who's worked as an artist or a creator knows, it's a spectrum you're constantly struggling to get on top of. The gap is between doing anything and doing nothing. Right? And someone who makes a log cat has already crossed over that gap. Does that make sense? That gap between doing something and doing, how many of you have looked at memes hundreds and thousands of millions of times and yet never once taken the time to try and test your hands at it yourself? You've never actually taken the time to create one. Even if it's stupid and it dies off, that's okay because you've now just bridged that gap from doing nothing and doing something. The first time we do anything, it's pretty throwaway. It's pretty bad, it's pretty awful. But that's okay because now we're on that path. You know what I mean? That's all it takes. That's what we want for our students. We want to set them on that path. And there's so many different ways to do this kind of stuff. It's not like there's one size fits all. And there's a lot of lessons that we can embed into this kind of thing. Something as simple as pie charts. I love pie charts for two reasons. Pie charts are good for two things. One, there's the data end of it. And understanding how to take a data set and actually create a pie chart from it. That's what the mathematicians love. But there's another part of it. When do you use a pie chart? Why do you use a pie chart? How do you use a pie chart to tell a story, to support a point? You know what I mean? There are times when the pie chart makes more sense than others. There are other times where it doesn't matter. And that element of it can actually be stripped of the data. There are some wonderful, wonderful memes related to pie charts or using pie charts to communicate. For example, this one. There's a pie chart of the things that Sting, Sting watches. Things like every move you make, every step you take, every vow you break, every smile you fake. This is a breakdown of all the things that Sting, uh, Sting watches, right? Here's another one. Causes of the Civil War, economics, state rights, slavery. Do we actually need percentages in there to understand what that student was trying to communicate? You don't. You don't even need them to say a word. They don't even need to open up their mouth for you to understand already sort of where they're coming from, what their point of view is, what their stance is. We could separate the message from the data. One of my other personal favorites is this one. These are the things that meatloaf would do for love. <laughs> if you were born before, you know, after um, <laughs> a certain time, I apologize. That probably doesn't make any sense at all. It's a song by meatloaf. Anyway. Um, yeah, and then it's also a matter of looking back through history and, and adding new context to it to show that was then, this is now, that sort of thing. There's a Tumblr that's absolutely brilliant called Classical Art Memes, and it goes through and it finds classical images and adds new context to them. For example, that ankle, you know? I love that. So it's basically a, t a statement about modesty in the digital age and so on. Some of them are just light and fluffy when someone arrives late to class. This is the look that everybody gives them and so on. And then for the music teachers, I love this one. Who wants to hear a symphony? I said, who wants to hear a symphony? I can't hear you. Which makes a lot more sense if you know who that is. Who is it? And why is it funny? It's death. 
For some of you are going, ah, right, exactly. You have to have that context, that background knowledge, that understanding, right? But this is a perfectly valid way to demonstrate knowledge and understanding. It's just one of many, 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 many ways. There are lots of ways to do that. That's why I love, I love sharing this little slide that uh, Wesley Fryer put together. I, not, I should have the URL over there. It's called showwithmedia.com. Uh, um, he talks about all the different ways that people can demonstrate their knowledge and understanding using digital media, whether they do interactive writing, photo stories, quick edit videos, digital stories, eBooks, and so on. And memes work in perfectly. There's a friend, uh, Tara Martin, who is doing this uh, a whole little crusade. She's, she's created this whole little genre called book snaps. And what she tries to do is encourage educators that when they're having their students read, allow their kids to take notes and add context and demonstrate understanding using Snapchat. Now, I know some of you are hearing the word Snapchat and students in the same sentence and are already immediately stressed out. I get it. But the idea of using bitmojis and drawings, so the way that Snapchat works, the reason it's powerful, it's one of the only social mediums where the entire idea is, it, the important thing about Snapchat, most people believe the important thing about it is the fact that the messages disappear. That's not the actual biggest feature about it, the most popular. The biggest thing about it is that you're combining your image with your own layer of context that you're adding your own drawing, that you're adding your own text, that you're adding your own cartoons, your own stuff and so on, that you're taking that base image and then making it your own. That's why Snapchat resonates so much because kids want to do that. They want to personalize, they want to customize, they want to tweak and make it their own. That's why Snapchat works. That's why the book snaps works and so on. And whether you do it actually with Snapchat or you've simulated using something else doesn't necessarily matter. You're using it to tell a story. I don't care how you use it to tell a story. Digital stories are just a powerful way for students to communicate. One of my other favorite memes is this one. The boyfriend one, have you ever seen this one? All right, so you can just look at this image and you get the story, right? But you can take that same message and you can use it to talk about your uh, food habits. The girl, the red girl, the $30 pot tie delivered to my door, me is the guy, and the groceries that I bought yesterday is the angry girlfriend. You know what I mean? Uh, this one, the new books at the bookstore, me, and then the unread, untouched books that I have sitting at home. I love this one going from a mythology standpoint. The red girl is literally everything and anything, and then you've got Zeus and you've got Hera, <laughs> you know? Now what's fascinating to me also is, somebody looked at the found, they were doing some searches for clip art, and they found this image, and they realized that those three people are actually in other images as well. And he decided to tell an entire story just using those three people. There's the distracted boyfriend uh, girl and so on, right? But then if you go over here, oh, it looks like she didn't learn her lesson and they're buying something expensive together. Same people, right? Oh no, that girl, that's bad news. <laughs> Total deadbeat, and you knew it. Now look what happened. What did I tell you? He gone. Uh oh, no, 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 no. You better not take him back. The red flags just piled up and piled up, didn't they? Oh, justified. Too little, too late, though. Oh, and that's really. And then you got the broken picture frame and so on and so forth. He actually strung together about like 30 or 40 of these to tell the tale of these two people, right? Isn't that just kind of a fascinating way to do it? It doesn't always just have to be images either. It can also just be mashing up video or just a, taking video and chopping it up with a different song. This was from the Olympics. This is one of my other favorites, right? This was taking the story. Remember the story of Michael Phelps and uh, Ryan Lochte and all the drama around the swimming and all that other kind of stuff? Well, somebody decided that it felt very video game-ish, so why not mash it up with a little Mario action?
played Mario as, as a kid, or as an adult, or yesterday, right? <laughs> Especially. All they did was just take that footage, add another layer to it, add that little context, you know, the, the, the audio to it, and they kind of told the whole story in a very simple, creative, and compelling way. I'm not saying every kid is going to do this. I'm not saying you want to teach every kid to do this, but I think kids should have that opportunity to be able to stretch themselves and dig deeper. I think all too often we sort of limit, we kind of box our kids in, not deliberately, not because we're bad teachers, but because it's just the way that we've always done things. I love this quote from Henry Jenkins. He says, the worst thing that a kid can say about homework is that it's too hard. The worst thing that a kid can say about a game is that it's too easy. Isn't that crazy, the difference between those two? A kid just wants to be done with their homework as quickly as possible. I'll give you a quick example of this. My son, he's playing sa uh, learning saxophone, right? His saxophone teacher was trying to just keep it casual and chill. So he told him, you only have to practice 10 minutes a night. No more, you know, just 10 minutes a night and that's good, you'll be fine. You know what that means to a fifth grader? He gets out his saxophone, he takes an iPad, he sets a timer for 10 minutes, and when the timer goes off, he is done. In the middle of a note, he is done. It basically doesn't mean practice for at least 10 minutes. It means practice no more than 10 minutes ever. That's what winds up happening. And when we say your assignment is due Friday, we do the same thing. I don't care how into this assignment you are, how into this project you are, how hard you're working on it, how deep you're going. On Friday, you will be done. And that is it. Wrap it up. We got to move on. What if we were to just kind of change that a little bit? What if instead of on Friday we said, you don't have to necessarily turn in your assignment, but it's going to be a checkpoint, more like a video game. You need to get there. I need to see how you're doing. I just need to check your score. But if you want to keep going on and go next level and dig deeper, more power to you. Go right ahead. I would encourage that. I just need to know whether you've learned what we were hoping to learn so that we can keep moving forward. It's just a perspective shift. It's just a slight little shift. I love this quote for that, I've been talking about this for years. It's these guys, a couple of science teachers out of Pennsylvania that first shared this with me. They say, I no longer give my students assignments. Instead, I give them creative briefs. Now, what's the difference between that? An assignment is, we're all gonna learn this, and now all of you are going to do a diorama, or all of you are going to do a science lab, or all of you are going to do this, and then you will turn it into me. The difference is with creative briefs, we're all gonna learn this, now prove it to me. Prove it to me. How are you gonna prove it to me? That's up to you. Could it be a diorama? Sure. Could it be a science lab or an essay? Yeah, it could be an essay, it could be a science lab. Could it be a meme? Maybe. Could it be a series of pictures that tell a story? Quite possible. Could it be a digital story, an animated one, or a mashup? Maybe. If you can watch that mashup and say, this person has effectively communicated what I wanted them to learn. Could it be a song? Sure. Could it be an interpretive dance? If you're teaching photosynthesis and a student wants to show it to you, demonstrate for you through interpretive dance, you should probably stop them. <laughs> or at least have them think about it. But could they do it? Maybe. They might be able to. I've kind of thrown down this gauntlet in a variety of presentations over the last few years. A friend of mine in Michigan, Nick Provenzano, is a language arts teacher in high school. And he gave his kids the option. He said, if you want to do a digital story, go right ahead. If you want to do an interpretive dance, go right ahead. And two kids, while they were studying The Great Gatsby and The Catcher in the Rye, they chose to take him up on it. And they decided to do an interpretive analysis comparing two characters in uh, Gatsby, Catcher in the Rye, so uh, through interpretive dance. You want to see what that looks like? All right. So here, 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 I'm not going to play you the whole thing because we only have limited time and so on, right? Okay? I'm just going to play you a little snippet of it. So this is a shape. Each character had their own dance, their own accessory, their own music, uh, and so on. And a little quote from the song, and then this is their dance representation. Now she's back in the atmosphere with drops of Jupiter.
All right, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna fast forward and show you Daisy as well, okay? Daisy is right here. this point, you have a clear understanding of the difference between Daisy and Jane, right? 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 Anyone want to stand up here and tell me the differences between Daisy and Jane? Anybody here completely baffled between the differences between Daisy and Jane? Because I'll be honest, I watched these videos and I called them up and I said, tell me you failed these kids, right? <laughs> because I didn't see any sort of real difference between them. This totally went over my head. I don't get it at all. So I called up Nick and I said, so what do you think? How do you deal with it? And she said, no, 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 no. For Daisy, they chose this song and this lyric because it represents this about her character and they use this prop because it speaks to this scene in that book, which was you know, demonstrative of da 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 and so on. And the way that they danced like this, it was representing this. And the, he was able to break the entire thing down based solely on what they shared in this video. And you know what that demonstrates? I wasn't their target audience. And they knew who their target audience was, and they were able to effectively demonstrate what they had learned through something they were passionate about. Nick didn't change his rubric. If someone did it as an essay, he graded them the same way that he graded this interpretive dance. It's at the end of the day, are they able to effectively communicate what they've learned? And the medium itself doesn't necessarily matter. That's what I want. I am tired. I think the days of us giving an assignment to students and expecting 20 of the same thing back are numbered. Those days are numbered. I think we're better than that. I don't think we need to do that anymore. And there's a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot of ways to start bridging that gap. And one of those ways just happens to be using things like memes. It opens it up. It gets the creative juices flowing. It lets your students know that you are allowing them to get creative and be playful and to have fun. And that's why it, grab it, it, that's why it resonates with me. We talked about some of the more serious ends of it. It's because we also want them to understand the social context, the underlying meanings, the point of view and stance and so on and so forth. That's all important too. But also we want our students to be able to share the things that they're passionate about in new and creative and diverse ways. You're gonna be at a conference this week where you're gonna be showing all sorts of different creative challenging ways for students to demonstrate the things that we've learned. My personal viewpoint isn't that you should take any one of those and have all 20 of those kids do it and then move on to the next one. It's that once the kids have that in their toolbox, they should be able to use that for any assignment from there on going forward, whether it's in your class or any other class. Isn't that what we want for our students? For them to be able to demonstrate their knowledge, understanding, and passion through the medium that resonates most with them. That's what we want. So I hope that throughout the rest of the conference you keep that in mind. I hope that you take the time to share the things that you're learning and maybe you'll even stretch yourselves and share some of that learning through things like sketch notes or things like memes, through things like social media. Maybe you'll give Snapchat a try or Instagram a try or Twitter a try and so on. I hope that you push on your own boundaries a little bit and like he was talking about in that video, that you move from doing nothing in one field or genre to doing something and get yourself on that pathway to creativity as well. But if nothing else, if you forget every single other thing that I talked about during this presentation, if you're only going to take one thing with you, I hope the one thing you're going to remember is this. Oh, I've had the volume.